say to this, would it be also part of the messiastic view? Or how, how, how would it happen? In my opinion, I'll give you my opinion, right? I think most Christians, wouldn't, they wouldn't lose too much sleep over it, theologically. They would fit in, they would say, you see, it was just an episode, it was just a colonial, temporary thing, but the suffering of the Jews is part of the cause. It was written, you see, it's confirmed. Eusebius' thesis in the third century, fourth, is, is confirmed. The Jews, you know, lost their privilege. They would rethink now the temporary rethinking. I don't think it would present a trauma. The trauma is the existence of Israel, not the destruction of Israel. I, you know, I hate to say the word, but I don't think it would present a theological dilemma, frankly. <coughs> the dilemma is our continued existence, and it remains a spur that forces rethinking. And I'm, I try to help Christians find a good way. They say, what's left for us? I say, what's wrong with the Sermon on the Mount? You got a problem with that? Try to live that one for all lifetime. There's more than enough programs you could create just based on that. That's a beautiful text. It doesn't have to be the text of, of replacement theology or, or whatever texts are used in order to denigrate or the polemic, the Jews, the polemic against the Jews. Get rid of the polemic and just think of the essence. There are beautiful texts in the New Testament that could be the basis for programs. So I feel funny that I'm trying to help them find an agenda for themselves so they don't have to feel that they lost their identity in the fact that we regain a good part of ours. That's the dilemma. Chaim and then Dr. Malcolm Lowe. Not the reason that you uh, enumerated which uh, bring a Christian to study Judaism. I didn't hear the word guilt. Uh, and after having seen the film of uh, Mr. Lindbergh's film about how the uh, Dutch people behaved during uh, the Holocaust period, I expected some feeling of guilt. <coughs> and uh, I don't know, it, uh, it doesn't appear. I lived in France for many years, and I was also amazed that the French didn't feel guilty, but late, it's never too late. Chirac admitted the responsibility of France, the official France, <laughs> in the Holocaust, uh, in, the, in the collaboration. Do you hear any voices in Holland criticizing the Dutch people, the Dutch uh, authorities on their behavior during the Holocaust? Um, I'm sorry, uh, this is Dr. This is Kainasis. Kainasis. Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, I did mention, I said it's an act of tshuva, no. learning is an act of tshuva. That's, oh, tshuva. That's, that's, I did, that was my last point. But it's not important. No. Your, your question is, is that expressed? You know, that whole issue of Dutch, of the Dutch uh, role is a very touchy subject. I put it on your outline as the background. Um, uh, uh, perhaps I can best demonstrate this through the experience of the concentration camp that's in the city where I live. Through. There was a small concentration camp, a work camp, that existed for two years through which 31,000 people passed. Most there were some people who were executed there, but that wasn't the main point. It was a work camp, and uh, it was approximately 50% Jews, 14,500 Jews, the rest were non. They took people out of the society who could be rabble-rousers or entertainers or leaders. And uh, now it's a national monument where people come to learn about. And now, the, what do they learn when they visit such a camp? Well, they learn about the uh, occupation, primarily. That's the primary issue. Ju the Holland under occupation by the Germans. The Germans. They also learn about the persecution of Jews, but it's not the main story. And I, I was at the memorial last year, a year ago, May, in my day at And the mayor of Nijmegen, or Appledorn, was asked to speak uh, in the opening of the program, the memorial, which they have every year. And then he spoke about the terrible things that happened during the occupation, the persecution, what happened to the Jews, the homosexuals, and the gypsies. He mentioned those three, one after the other. And he gave a very good talk. But I decided to check. I want to check this out. So I looked at the NEO, at the, 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 that's the official uh, documentation center, the statistics on casualties in World War II of of the of homosexuals and, and gypsies and Jews. My friend, you would not believe the, 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 the discrepancy between, or the distance between these figures. Officially, in those figures, there wasn't one homosexual killed 
because he was homosexual. They persecuted, not killed because of homosexual. In those figures, there were 300 and something gypsies. There were 105 or so thousand Jews. Jews constituted 46 percent of the casualties of war of Holland in the European theater. They represented 0.015 percent of the population. They suffered 3,000. 400 more times in casualties than the population. Ze Omer Dasheni. Was this acknowledged in some way of, in, in Holland as such? Professor Lifshitz wrote a book about it on the return of the surviving Jews. It's called The Kleine Shoah, The Small Shoah. And the point of it is that there was no special uh, understanding. They were treated then as Dutch citizens. During the war, they were treated as Jews. After the war, they were treated as Dutch citizens. So therefore, no special treatment, no special acknowledgement of what they went through. And this is the sore spot also for the non-Jews and also for the Jews. The non-Jews, because if they acknowledge that, it requires a great examination of self collectively. Some of it has been done. There has been some of it done. I can't evaluate. They can probably know more about it than I do, but there has been some of it done. But hardly to the extent that you would expect from such a national tragedy. But it's also a dilemma for the Jews, because the Jews live at the myth that the, the Dutch were rescued them from the Inquisition. I'm saying this in large now. Huh? They res they, this was a place of refuge. In Holland, he was safe. Well, that myth is a beautiful myth, and it's probably true in relative terms. But if you read the details of the treatment of Jews, even in Holland, the myth is not based completely on reality. The example is, again, in my city of Frucht, there's a Jewish cemetery there. The city of Frucht has a cemetery. It's still active. The cemetery was founded in 1188. What's the basis for that cemetery? The murder of 180 or so Jews because they didn't believe in Jesus. That information comes to me from the archives of Frucht, official records of the cemeteries of Frucht. So when I ask Fruchteners, do you know when the first pogrom took place in Furcht? They always tell me World War II. I said, no, I'm talking about the Dutch. No one has any idea. And I said, how come I know this and you don't? The answer is because I'm a Jew, it's my family, and it's very natural that you wouldn't know that. But that shows that lack of knowledge. And you can go from every city, Nijmegen, Deventer, you can go through all the cities, they're little memorial books. And there's a man, Jan Bader, wrote 10 volumes on the history only and the province of Brabant. We went through every city, Tilburg, Eindhoven, Dembos, Breda, uh, 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 little books, and he went through all the records and details, and then you get a different picture. The Jews are not interested in changing their picture, because then they'll feel alienated from Holland. They think of themselves as Dutch. The mayor of Amsterdam, Jot Cohen, in an interview to, uh, it's either Annie Vey or Jot uh, Holland. It's a, a very glossy magazine. He says, I'm a Nederlander. He comes from Maastricht. I'm a Nederlander. I'm not. I'm a Jew. I know that. But I'm first of all, I'm a Nederlander. He's proud of being a Nederlander. You want to give him a feeling of being alienated in a country which is his mother country, and so it's a very painful thing. I remember a man Levison, uh, Oliver Shalom. He's the. He was a very active person. I once asked him, why didn't the Queen issue a statement from England to the railroad workers to sabotage the railroad? She did it in 1944 in order to support the Allied drive to invade Han, and all the railroad workers disappeared. They disappeared in Carbon. I said, why? So you know what he said to me? She didn't know that that was going on. I said, come on, Mr. But that's not. But he insisted, because if he had to admit that she didn't know what was going on, and that she didn't call for that same lack of cooperation, then he'd have to, he'd feel insecure in his own identity as a Nederlander. And I couldn't understand that. I, I mean, I'm not being critical of the Jews now. I'm just trying to describe to you the very un <coughs> unsettled feeling. That's why I'm an outsider. I allow myself to ask questions, and I know people are uncomfortable, so I don't press it. I have a pastoral, and I'm a rabbi. I can understand that. But we also have to know the truth sometimes. And Holland is a lovely country to live in, as lovely as any other country in the modern world today. That's not the issue. The issue is how do we grapple with the shadow side of ourselves. The present generation is not the generation that was there then, but they inherit the legacy of the memories and 
if they're Christians, they inherit the legacy of their religious traditions, and there are many good Christians that want to do something about it, and sometimes they just don't know how to do it. These are some of the efforts that are being made. I think our task, those that are aware of it, is to help them. There's not no point yelling, screaming, getting upset. It's to help. If you understand it, you can help focus the effort for new directions, because that's what we're about. Baruch Hashem from Medinat Yisrael. Medinat Yisrael brought about a complete possibility of rethinking the direction of history, also in Holland. And I'm grateful for it. I'm very happy to live in Holland, even though it's not Medinat Yisrael. There's nothing like Yerushalayim, but that's not the issue. But it's a very decent place to live in, and there's many, many possibilities. Imagine studying Talmud. Imagine coming in a church and telling them that, you know, if you want to have love, you have to also have criticism, and you have to read Leviticus. And I'm in this Catholic church, and the, and, um, and the next to me is a hall. Next to me is the church itself through the glass door. And you see Jesus hanging from the cross in many different positions of agony. So the speaker intro introduces me to the audience like this. He said, oh, we're very honored. For the first time, we have a rabbi in our church. And I said, no, no, it's not the first time. And I looked over there. <laughs> I said, and even if you don't like the lecture, I hope you don't treat me, you know. Like, <laughs> 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 you treat me that way. <laughs> okay, Malcolm and then uh, then, and then Ben Cohen. <clears throat> There are a set of points which I could take up without concentrating one. And it's when you describe Christianity, I don't recognize myself. I mean, you describe something which is uh, Christianity, what it did, and what it thought. I mean, I don't recognize myself. Which part are you referring to? Hmm? Which description Your are you referring to? Of Christianity and Christian attitudes and Christian thoughts about the state of Israel. I don't, I let me explain. I was born in 1939, so I grew up during and immediately after the war. And I come from an Anglican family, and I went to a school which was predominantly Congregationalist and Baptist. So, I mean, I didn't, you know, I, I wasn't growing up, as it were, in some obscure hole somewhere. Uh, and in my religious education, it was always clear that the land of Israel is the land of the Jews. In fact, I didn't even know the Jews had left the land of Israel. I only knew <laughs> because the state of Israel, maybe, uh, I mean, I only sort of really realized this maybe when I was about 15 or something like that. But before that, it's quite clear to me this is the land of the Jews. And uh, naturally, the Jews are living here, why not? Uh, I mean, so in the Bible, this is where they live. So, uh, and it was quite clear to me, you're right, that they didn't, uh, some of them accepted Jesus and some of them didn't, you know, there was an argument about it, well, fair enough, I mean, nothing's, you know, uh, nothing's obvious to everybody. And uh, so the fact when I learned there was a state of Israel, I thought, well, it makes a lot of sense, you know, I mean, it's what, uh, this is what I grew up, you know, that's what I was thinking of. Uh, and what's going on alone? I mean, there, 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 there are, in my time and even before, there are millions of who grew up in a similar sort of uh, thing. No surprise. And uh, also, that the state of Israel is not perfect. Well, not perfectly perfect. Look at the Bible. I mean, the Jews are not perfect. That's they're, they're clear. You know, they're not perfect. They do a lot of things wrong. They get themselves into a mess. Eventually, God rescues them. You know, and from my point of view, I wouldn't take the business of Palestinians. I would say the Oslo people. When it came out, I thought, yeah, the Jews making another stupid mistake. And, uh, well, if you would have been the advisor to Pope Pius X, I'm we would sorry, have been I'm in good shape. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Even more so, there are some positions yeah. in the foreign ministry that you could fill right now. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you another thing. Yeah. You see, uh, people's understanding of all this has been spoiled by an extremely bad book written by somebody called Rosemary Luther, who gives a supposed history of Christian uh, <coughs> hatred towards the Jews. This book is so full of mistakes, I couldn't, you know, I mean, you did an mm -hmm. encyclopedia to, to explain them all. In fact, on, on the New Testament, I pointed out some mistakes, but she has mistakes with the Church Fathers, too. Uh, there is a popular view of Augustine which says, Augustine said all the Jews were expelled from the land of Israel for all time. This is not true. Augustine's view, and you can find it, and I can show you the passage directly, is that the Jews were expelled from the city of Jerusalem because... Uh, of their uh, refusal to witness. But, he says, refusal to what? they were expelled from the city of Jerusalem. For refusal? For their sins. Like all the sins you know, they were expelled <coughs> for. Anything. But, he also emphasizes 
that uh, according to the Bible, the Jews have to be in the land of Israel forever. Uh, and he goes in very detailed discussion, showing it clearly refers, and he says, we talk about Abraham's seed in the flesh and in the spirit. The Jews are the seed in the flesh, and the promises to the Jews uh, that they will stay in the land forever refer to the Jews in the flesh. That is the seed of Abraham in the flesh. In other words, the Jews have. And then he says, all right, they've been kicked out of Jerusalem, but look, they're all living everywhere in the land of Israel to this day. So his view is not that all the Jews are being driven out of the land of Israel. This is a real Augusta, not the way in which he's properly presented by people. This is the way Augusta, as you understand. Yeah, yeah. Not the understanding, he says it explicitly. This is what he says. He says that the, for their sins they were thrown out of Jerusalem. But there's, not only are they in the land of Israel, but they have to be. I would, I would say so this is not... Oh, can I explain oh, something? Yeah. And there are other things, you see, people talk about the church fathers, and it's a kind of global view. In fact, what you find that wherever they talk about Jews, they have a lot of criticism, they say very nasty things, but there are also certain nuances. There's one in uh, Jerome who says he personally thinks the Jews would ever re-establish their state in the land of Israel, but he says there are so many distinguished thinkers who say the opposite that I do not uh, assert this um, unequivocally. So, you see, in uh, and I, have, I don't have to tell you that Christian Zionism precedes Jewish Zionism for at least a century. And you know, where did Lord George come from? And where did uh, Wingate come from? You know? And why Christian did, uh, why did Truman God. call himself Cyrus? I mean, so I reckon, you said, I was Cyrus. So you see, uh, the creation of the state of Israel was not something that came mm -hmm. out of the blue to a lot of people. To a lot of people, it was, well, this is what we were always expecting. I would say, Malcolm, I don't disagree with the things you say. I would say that these are the voices and the texts, the proper readings, let's say, that could be uh, recruited and availed when you're trying to give those Christians that didn't understand that an authentic grounding in another way to understand themselves. But these were not the voices that were uh, that were emphasized in the large. In, you were lucky that you were brought up as no, you were no, brought up. Lucky. But in the large, in the large, this is not the way Jews were presented in the churches, in all the churches, whether it's Greek Orthodox, whether it's the Russian Orthodox, whether it's the Catholics, or whether it's the Protestants. Your example is a very good example that there is an alternative model available that would jive with another way of understanding ourselves. I would laud the effort to help Christians find these new ways. I'm happy to hear what you're saying, so that you don't see stuff in my words. I accept that. But I think that many Christians do, and yeah, I'm not making that up. Kind of they tell me that. In Christianity, which doesn't exist, there is not a single Christian in the Dutch Reformed Church, church though, was in that, in the mentality yeah. he described. Okay. Then, then, after that, the, the prevailing here. view among Dutch Reformed Christians was as as was the described. Okay, then, and then Ben, and then I have two more. See, I was interested in trying to understand the new paradigm you present as Israel as a new theological and political reality within the rubric or under the rubric of, Israel, of, of Jewish Christian relations and inject the issue of Islam and radical Islam into the theological and political discussion in, in, in Holland, perhaps as a model for Europe. It, uh, Dr. Gersenfeld has, has uh, published a book on the riots in France uh, based on the difficult they had there between the Muslim and Christian community, or the Muslim community with France. What, how has that sh turned the dial, if it has, on Christian Jewish relations slash Dutch-Israeli relations? This whole issue, of, whether it's Ayn Hirsi Ali as, as an example, but the whole problem of, theological problem of radical Islam, which has proclaimed war on Christianity. In Holland, has that in any way affected Jewish Christian relations? That's that's very very good, very good uh, question. Um, one of the efforts that's made by a group like the platform Carrick in Israel, which I listed as one of the uh, pro-Israel tendencies, platform Carrick in Israel lobby within the Protestant Church, it's in point five. They have study conferences every year. And one of their study comes was dedicated to your question to help Christian theologians understand that the Islamic 
Jewish discussion and not the Israel-Palestinian discussion is what is at the root of the difficulty here in the Middle East. Because Christian, it's convenient even to think of our difficulties here geographically as a result of some political disagreement, territorial disagreement, but not a deep theological disagreement. It's convenient because it, it, allow, it, it allows you to think that if you have a little few negotiations with Condoleezza Rice, you'll make some compromises. He'll give a little land, we'll give a little land, then we solve the problem. And they're missing out on the fact, fact that just as in Christian theology, in many of the Christians, not all of them, the Jewish people in their land was a theological problem, so too for Islam is the national entity called the State of Israel a theological problem for Islamic theology. Because under Islamic theology, and I'm saying this in the large, this region must be Muslim. It cannot be broken through by an entity that is not Muslim. Muslims in the various societies <coughs> under the Ottomans earlier recognized the Jewish people as a religious group, even though they had falsified their scriptures, but nevertheless they were the people of the book. They had to be given a place. They had to be left alone as second grade citizens. There's a room for that. But there's no room for an independent political entity called Medinat Israel. It's, it's an indignity to Islam. Now, Christians in Holland don't understand that. So then they put a lot of pressure on Israel to, why, don't, why are you building a wall? Why don't you make political compromises? They don't understand that the difficulty lies in the interfaith region because they don't know very much about Islam. That's one of the reasons. One of the contributions of Professor Hans Janssen in this discussion was as a historian to lay bare Batya, what's her name? Batya Batya Or. She has written about the Dimi issue, Dimi too. She has shown that the issue is not, it's not a political economic, it's not a Marxist issue. It's not a Marxist, it's a theological issue. I hate to say it, but religion does matter to some people. It's not popular. We like to reduce everything to water supply, economics, jobs, transportation, geography, territory, and so on. These are legitimate issues where people have conflict. That's not the primary conflict here. The primary conflict here is a religious conflict, and it impinges exactly on your question. Can Islam, will Islam within itself find the means by which, without feeling disloyal to itself, acknowledge the legitimacy of another spiritual collective entity called the State of Israel? with a culture that is another religion? Or will they continue to dream of being the masters of the entire region and therefore making this a long-term conflict? It's important that Christians understand that in order to lower the tone of pressure on us for solutions which won't, be, which won't hold water and endanger us in that. So there's a linkage. There's a linkage between the the Christians have gone through this, this trauma of realizing that the state of Israel can be accepted religiously. We have to rethink Christian identity. Islam will have to do the same kind of exercise. In principle, every religion can do that exercise. But an outsider can't do that for them. Only a Muslim can do it for them. Bush and Blair can't do that for them. They can talk about moderate Islam, radical Islam. It's not the issue of moderate or radical. It's a question of the mainstream Islam. Can they accept that a Jewish entity is legitimate in a region that's a Dalam al-Islam? Bernard Lewis has written about it, others. And to me, it's clear that, that this is a long-term issue. There will be pragmatic moments, of course, and we'll be happy for those pragmatic moments. It's not by accident. Hans Janssen says to me, the most anti-Semitic country in this region is Egypt, and we have a peace treaty with Egypt, mm -hmm. and it's held. It's held since 1978. So why is it anti-Semitic? The answer is because it's a pragmatic peace arrangement. It's not an, it's not an ideational, ultimate acceptance that we are an authentic presence here with our own culture, with our own spirituality. I wish it were otherwise, friends. I wish it were otherwise, because our grandchildren are going to have to continue to cope with this problem. That's the point. I wish it were otherwise. But I suggest, yeah, I have three more questions. 
that uh, we take the three questions okay. and you answer them together. Okay. We have Ben Cohen, Lea De Lange, and Professor Yossi Kahn. Okay. Well, thank you. Do Dr. Marks, my, uh, my question is, is loosely related to the previous question and your, your previous answer. And I wanted to ask you about Holocaust education and Holocaust. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you about that with reference to a story which recently appeared, I think, in the Dutch Jewish press, and then was reported as well in the Jerusalem Report, I believe. And the story was basically this. It's well known that teaching the Holocaust, particularly in areas of the Netherlands where you have high, uh, high immigrant population, high, high population of immigrant children, frequently the lessons become impossible. There, are, there is abusive behavior towards the <coughs> teachers. The, the children literally refuse to learn about the Holocaust. Now, my understanding is that very recently in Amsterdam, they introduced, they subcontracted an outside agency to remodel the Holocaust education curriculum. And they did two things. Uh, one was to redefine anti-Semitism. So that anti-Semitism is no longer about distinctly hating Jews, but it's the old Arab myth that, you know, no, it's about, well, I'm a Semite, so therefore I can't be anti-Semitic. So anti-Semitism uh, applies to both Jews and Arabs. The second thing that was reported was that the level, the, the, the exterminationist or the eliminationist element of the Holocaust was played down. So that the way that concentration camps ended up being described in this curriculum was almost like the David Irving version of what a concentration camp was, which was a place where people did hard labor and occasionally they would die of illness like typhus. Now, I don't know if this particular story is familiar, not familiar to you. but it, it uh, sounds familiar, but it's not particularly known. It's certainly something of concern. But, uh, and, you know, before I say hand on heart that it's correct, I would, I would want to, to verify it independently. But from what I know from, from the research that I've done on trends in Holland, it wouldn't surprise me if, 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 if this was true. So I wonder. I have a comment to make on yeah. that. Okay. Let's take Any Lea question? and yeah. Yossi doesn't. Yeah? Okay? So we take only Lea and then you take yeah, the I've forgotten what I wanted to say. <laughs> but, but first of all, I wanted to tell you that you had a very difficult job. You have such a difficult word. It, I, I would say it's almost impossible. Because what is Christianity? I, and in my eyes, uh, after having uh, written about this for many, many years and contacted those people and spoken to them, you have Christians against Israel. And they, they I think they are the most numerous. They are against Israel. It's also very hard. What's Israel? What's Israel? For me, Israel is the people of the, the people of the Bible. We, the Jews, we are Israel, and Israel is the Jewish people. And, uh, and that's what Christians also understand. But you have Christians against Israel. There is no possibility to even talk to them. Because they are sure, they are convinced that the Jews have only got to do one thing, to disappear. They, they have to become Christians. So how can you ever have a relationship? How can you ever teach people that are only convinced that you, Israel, have to disappear? You have to become Christian. And that's exactly the same thing that the Muslim see the Jew. And on the other hand, you have the Christians for Israel, the Christians for Israel, the Christians for Israel, and it is hard for me to decide, and maybe you can tell us how you see that, it is hard for me to decide whether those people even identify themselves or are on the border of stopping to identify themselves as Christians. And they also say things like that. I'm not a Jew, I am a Gentile, but don't call me a Christian. I am a Christian for Israel and Christian for Israel. And I don't want to belong to this stream called Christianity. And, and it, it must be very hard. It must be very hard. Well, I appreciate uh, the, your sympathy for me. <laughs> it is, it's not hard, but it's actually, uh, I think you're painting, you're painting a bit of a black and white picture, maybe there's more nuances. Uh, let me first respond to the Holocaust education thing. Uh, it's, it's true what you're saying, 
that it's very it's hard for the Dutch teachers to bring the Holocaust in, in particular where you have Muslim students. I mean, it's not immigrant groups, it's Muslim groups. Because the Muslims are getting another it's the Holocaust denial and, 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 and they're the Holocaust victims in Palestine. That's what they're hearing. So when they when they bring it up, they go, what do you mean? They're interested the Israelis are the Nazis and then what are you telling me that they were the victims and that kind of stuff. What's the corrective to it? There are a few efforts to make corrective. One is uh, Sami Kaspi has an institute called Sticht Maimon Stichting, or Stichting Maimon. This man is a Berber Jew from Morocco. He speaks Berber, Arabic. He goes into the schools in Amsterdam. He talks to them in Mamel Russian. And he says to him, what are you, you don't know, first of all, you're not Arabs. You're Berbers, he tells them. And your grandfathers and my grandfathers, we used to celebrate the Maimuna together. We were neighbors. We respected each other. So what are you, you don't even know your own tradition. And he tries through this way to have committees. I think Yop Cohen, they set up committees, even from the liberal community, has contacts with imams. I sat in on one of them, where they had a kind of an interfaith discussion over other issues, not Israel, about some halachic sharia issue over medical ethics, as a way of bringing people together. There are efforts made to bring people together. I, myself, an anecdote that I could tell you, I was asked to give a a, a one-hour session on Judaism in a high school, an agricultural high school in my area of St. Paul's, the Green School, as it's called, the Chuna School. And, you know, one hour to 15-year-olds, 16-year-olds. Then the class, you've got to have at least 20% of Muslims. So what did I do? I brought a tape recorder with a CD from uh, the, the Goyim. The Goyim is a, a klezma group made up of Goyim. But they're great. They're real klezma, Dutch group. I put that on, blasted it loud, didn't say one word. I brought the Abdullah candles, Shabbos candles, Hanukkah candles, Yorkshire candles. I brought my Talson filling, a chauffeur, a grager, everything that made noise and looked like something. I lit it up. I handed out wine with this piece of matzah. I didn't say one word. I just gave it out, and the music was blasting in those school hallway for 20 minutes. I didn't say a word. I just gave it out, and we lit candles, and then I suddenly stopped the music. Then I just waited until some kid would ask me a question, and then. I saw from those questions, because this curious, I went around, and when I gave wine, I could see the Muslim students, they would, didn't want to drink the wine, but even the matzahs, until they warmed up, until they warmed up. And I could see the reluctance of those students to want to be engaged. But what was the net, what was the bottom line? Bottom line was that the teacher from the other class said, could I do the same thing in her class? Why? Because it was so much fun to have a Jewish lesson. So the question is, what methodology are you going to use to engage in the schools, students who come from these homes with the reality and not...